Hello, and welcome to Wingtips Episode 2, An Apple a Day. I am your host, Benjamin Hale, and today I will be joined by retired Lieutenant Colonel Ronald Hale. Dr. Hale is currently the Network Medical Director for Radiation Oncology at Kettering Health in Dayton, Ohio. He retired from active duty service after 24 total years in the Air Force as a Lieutenant Colonel in 2011. He is double board certified in preventative medicine and public health, as well as radiation oncology. He graduated from the University of Buffalo School of Medicine on the Air Force Health Professions Scholarship Program. His first active duty assignment was his internship at Andrews Air Force Base in D.C. He also completed a Master's of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, Residency in Preventative Medicine at Johns Hopkins, and Residency in Radiation Oncology at the University of Rochester, all of which were through the Air Force Institute of Technology. Former Air Force assignments include work as a flight surgeon, cancer center director, public health officer, consultant to AETC command surgeon, and air staff with duties at the Pentagon. Welcome, retired Lieutenant Colonel Hale, to the second episode of Wingtips, an apple a day. We're very glad to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Great. So we're going to hop right into the first topic of the day, the academic mindset. Uh, so our first question here is going to be, what types of academic skills proved to be the most useful in your journey through college? Well, perhaps the most important skill uh, is the ability to be a proficient reader. Um, most of what you do through school uh, is, is reading. And, and the better you are at reading, uh, the better you're going to be able to assimilate new information. Um, one thing I would note is that uh, I did take advantage of tutors, especially for some of the more difficult subjects that I had. Uh, I found the tutors provided an opportunity uh, for me to, um, uh, to provide uh, encouragement to stay uh, up on my assignments. And also, uh, as I would go through material and found things that I uh, wasn't so clear on, a tutor was useful uh, in being able to, uh, to act like a sounding board. The one thing a tutor could never do, though, is make up for um, not being properly prepared. Uh, and many of my tutors along the way used to tell me this, that I can't pull off a miracle. You have to first put in the work, uh, and then when we meet, uh, it's productive. Um, I had tutors in um, organic chemistry, physics, uh, calculus, a lot of my, my tougher subjects, and uh, was very careful about who I engaged as a tutor. Great. That sounds awesome. So it, it really sounds like you use those external sources to aid you in your studies. Can you describe some ways that you would use those external sources to also keep your, your studies organized? Yeah, that's a great question. So organization is, is critical. Um, more important than having a plan is to be prepared. Uh, if you're prepared, then no matter what life throws at you, uh, you're going to have a good chance of dealing with it. Plans are good, uh, and I was active duty. I was in the Air Force a total of 24 years. And, you know, you, you have plans for everything. But at the end of the day, it's uh, a mindset and a state of preparedness that I think really gets you through uh, the unexpected times uh, when life throws a curveball at you. Uh, if you're prepared, then you're ready for it. So, Dr. Hale, you went to med school at University of Buffalo. Um, can you describe some ways that routines helped you out with getting through that process? Because med school can be a very daunting thing for many students. So uh, if you could elaborate on some ways that you stayed ahead of the curve using your uh, routines. Yeah, medical school is, is very challenging. And one of the things that I did uh, to be prepared was to attend a medical school um, actually at home uh, where I had a support system in place uh, that could help um, with sort of all of the other stuff. So I, I had actually gotten into, um, I applied to nine medical schools. I got into eight. The ninth I didn't get into because I, 
I didn't realize, again, this is uh, not being prepared, but that uh, that school had only accepted um, uh, in-state students. So of the eight I was eligible, and I got into all eight, there was one school that I really wanted to go to, and that was University of Buffalo. That was at home. The others, I suppose, were my backup schools. It helped to have um, to to attend medical school where uh, I, I actually I lived with my parents. Um, my uh, stepdad was a physician, and so it was a very supportive environment uh, to go through medical school. But I had absolutely a routine um, of studying um, every night and on weekends. Uh, I had certain places that I would study depending on what I was studying, uh, whether it would be a friend's house, the library, uh, or a, uh, an office that I had in the, in the house, uh, set up so that I could, uh, I could have everything, uh, set up for a good study session there. But routine was absolutely, uh, critical. Um, and your routine varies. It varied depending on, uh, what part of medical school, your first two years of medical school, you're in the classroom a lot. You've got labs, gross anatomy, microbiology. Uh, and so your your schedule's a little bit more uh, predictable. Your third year, you're in, generally, you're in your clinical rotations. And um, back in the day, you know, now things are different. But back then, you were um, on call, in some cases, every other day. So the, uh, the, the big issue was uh, how to just get sleep. Now things have changed, and it's a lot easier to set up a predictable routine even in your third year. Fourth year is elective time, and depending on the elective you're in, uh, you can you can definitely set up a routine. But the big challenge of medical, medical school, I would say, <clears throat> is getting your routine set up in your first two years. Right. That's, that's great. So you talk about study sessions or, or the – most important aspect of any sort of routine, right? Especially in medical school. So can you walk us through what one of your study sessions, you know, um, in medical school or in work today, because you still have to keep applying that academic mindset to your job today. I mean, in your field of radiation oncology, um, the education is always changing, right? So you're, you're still having to apply those techniques that you used in med school. So if you could walk us through some of those uh, study sessions, you know, what, what would that look like for you on a typical day? Well, I kind of think of the fact that we have what most would consider seven intelligences, uh, mathematical, uh, verbal, kinesthetic, social. Uh, and I think it's important to realize that um, that people learn in different ways. And e even within, let's say, I, let's say if I had a strong mathematical intelligence, uh, it's still going to be important for me to kind of ping the other areas. Um, so what I would do is is vary the types of study sessions I would have. And most of the study I would have would be alone. Um, medical school is very different from undergraduate, from college. And I think I want to make a little bit of a distinction here because in medical school, the strategy is to present material again and again until uh, you finally get it and then you apply it and you really never stop uh, acquiring, uh, like you said before, just acquiring the knowledge. It's, it's never ending. But for undergraduate, I would generally read ahead so that when I attended a lecture, I was prepared and anticipating what was going to be talked about. Then immediately after the lecture, um, preferably that day, I would review my notes and reread the chapter again. And where there were problems, let's say in math or chemistry, physics, um, I would do every problem in the book in that chapter uh, along, and they usually would give you an example and, and kind of map out how to do the problem. So by the time the test came, I had all of that done. I had prepared ahead of time for the lecture. Immediately after the lecture, review my notes, reread the chapter, do all the problems uh, in the text of the chapter. And then 
on typically a Friday night or a Saturday or both, um, I would then do problem sets to practice doing the problems. <clears throat> By the time the exam came, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't have a lot of studying to do. And what I would do then is have a study session with another person or preferably a group of people to make sure that I hadn't left any loose ends. Um, you know, something that uh, in my studies I had inadvertently overlooked. There's a saying that it's important to know what you don't know. And uh, one of the ways to, to mess up an exam is to not be aware that there was something that you should have been responsible for that you weren't. The group study sessions were never all that useful for me to sort things out and understand things. That's where I would rely on my tutor uh, if I had difficulty. Um, you know, and some of my friends would take advantage of office hours. Um, sometimes a TA would have a, a study session. I used to go to all of those things. I mean, you really, to, to excel you in, in college, or life, you have to do more than everybody else is doing. You you have to uh, you have to really apply yourself and work harder than anybody else is working. Um, I mean that's that's one of the big secrets, and I and I don't think it's a secret. I think that it's you know that's that's a common thing that you hear, but it's true. So you know, writing the notes listening to you reciting your notes. Um, nowadays, what I'll do is uh, I'll watch a, a video presentation so that I'm seeing a presentation, I'm hearing it, I'm taking notes so that I'm using multiple intelligences um, to acquire the information. Uh, maybe while I'm reading my notes, I'll walk around so that I, uh, I engage uh, more of my my body uh, in acquiring the information. Um, so there's a lot of techniques, and I think it's important to understand that um, it's going to vary depending on the person. So what worked for me isn't going to necessarily work for another person. But I know for me, it was very effective to have my routine and to have these different types of approaches uh, to acquiring the material. And a lot of it depended on the subject. For organic chemistry, I actually had a model set and I would work through each problem in the book and I would build each molecule and then actually change the molecule. Let's take the Grignard reaction, for instance, through each step of the reaction so that I could see it. So when it came to exam time and I was doing a problem, I was not only remembering what I had memorized and and writing what I had practiced, but I was visualizing in my mind what the molecule looked like and actually feeling, again, it's that kinesthetic intelligence, the tactileness of moving the atoms and the bonds to understand what is being asked in the question and then does that make sense? And uh, it was a very successful technique. Uh, and it's still, till today, uh, I use all those resources. Great, Dr. Hale. So we're going to talk about some times that you struggled to stay motivated with your Air Force career. Yeah, motivation is a really important issue. And, uh, you know, my Air Force career really started back in my undergraduate because I had gotten a scholarship uh, through uh, the Air Force, the Health Promotion Scholarship Program, HPSB. I think they still have it even today, uh, to get into medical school. And so I had to, you know, really excel in my undergraduate. I had to get an, uh, you know, a good acceptance in a medical school on the early end of the spectrum. And then, um, and then for my Air Force career, uh, there were, you know, times where, um, you know, I needed uh, to to reorient my motivation. In undergraduate, I used to use, um, I used to, to meditate and uh, visualize exactly, you know, what I wanted. In 4.0, in my classes, I, I could see the grade report with the A's and the, and the 4.0. Uh, 
And that was very effective. Uh, that was, for me, a really good way to, uh, to keep me driven um, during times when, you know, you've got a biochem lab, organic chem lab, biology lab, physics lab. Uh, things get pretty crazy. It's easy to get worn out. Uh, and, and meditation was a great way to stay focused. Through medical school, uh, you know, what motivated me there was quite honestly just getting through medical school, getting medical school done. Medical school is tough. It's, it's tough no matter what. And, uh, you know, the first two years are, are kind of dry, uh, and it seems like endless information. Uh, but, but what I look forward to is getting out into the clinics uh, my third year and, of course, my fourth year. <clears throat> Once that was done, I really started looking forward to my Air Force time. And so I did an Air Force internship at uh, Andrews Air Force Base, uh, Malcolm Grove Medical Center. And uh, it's a, I, they renamed it, I think it's Joint Base Andrews, but it's, it was Andrews Air Force Base. And that was a great experience. I, I love being active duty. Uh, I was looking forward to my first duty assignment. And uh, what kept me motivated through these years was just what I would call possibility thinking, uh, was having a, a constant awareness of all the things that were really possible with the career. I had a time right after my internship where I was assigned to a primary care clinic at Keesler Air Force Base, and I wasn't really doing what I wanted to do. Uh, I had, uh, you know, it was hard to get motivated uh, to go to work, and I recognized that quickly, and so I changed what I was doing. I got um, picked up for a position as a flight surgeon. I went to flight medicine school and uh, worked as a flight surgeon then for four years and loved it, loved every minute of it, uh, and uh, from there went into my first residency in preventive medicine and public health at Johns Hopkins, got my master's degree great experience. I had a, a one-year fellowship at uh, Air Staff at the Pentagon, uh, working on some very exciting things with the anthrax immunization program and, uh, and uh, some other really very exciting things that we worked on at the at, uh, headquarters Air Force. And then worked as an epidemiologist, public health doctor for four years at Lackland Air Force Base. And again, I felt as though I, I didn't, I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And so uh, just like before, I addressed my motivation by, by changing what I was doing. I got um, uh, a job at uh, Badgecom AETC as a consultant to the command surgeon. And then from there, uh, because of an adversity, my own dad had gotten diagnosed with cancer and used that to springboard into a completely new phase of my career as a cancer doctor. And so for a very personal reason, which was very motivating, uh, went into a very difficult four-year residency in radiation oncology. And uh, again, I guess the theme here is, as you go through life, there are gonna be times when your motivation lags, you have to recognize it, and you have to do what, what kind of juices you, what, what, what gets you up in the morning and, and make a change. Um, Ask yourself, uh, is what you're doing now consistent with your values? And if it's not, then align it. You know, align what you're doing with your values, and then you'll find the motivation again. Great. So in any of those settings there, I'm sure that you somehow experienced academic failure, right? Um, especially some period during medical school. Can you walk us through an instance where you experienced this failure in an academic setting and you rebounded from it? And, and can you give us some specific techniques of how you were able to then motivate yourself after you failed in that setting? Yeah, failure is common to everyone. And, and the most successful people are the ones who get really good at failing. And what it means to be good at failing is to fail, learn from that, and move on. You know, the, the, the wrong thing to do is to fail and keep failing because you didn't figure out what you did wrong or you figured it out, but you're, you're not fixing the issue. You know, I, I'm an undergraduate now, first year of college and uh, second semester chemistry, I got a D. 
Now, I wanted to go to medical school. I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, I wanted an Air Force scholarship. What do you do with a D? It's terrible. So, um, so I fixed it. Um, I transferred uh, to another school uh, where I felt as though their system of education was better suited to me. Um, I uh, re or rearranged my whole approach to study. Um, I got a tutor. And from that point on, I took that course again, got an A in it, got an A in all my organic chemistries. I took physical chemistry, got an A in all those courses, and, uh, and fixed it. Um, in medical school, I had, you know, I had a lot of difficulty in my psychiatry residency, uh, psychiatry rotation. And, um, you know, I came close to failing, but pushed through. It was temporary, and what I knew is that I, I didn't want to be a psychiatrist. And uh, it was kind of funny because the, the, uh, the instructor uh, said to me, uh, when, when, the, when the course finished, she said, I'm going to pass you. She said, because I want you to promise me that you're never going to do psychiatry, and I, I don't ever want to see you come back through my class again. So we're good. We're done. And I said, okay, that's a deal. Uh, I learned what I needed to know. But it just was not material that resonated with me. Some of my friends, they love psychiatry. But for me, I had a hard time getting through it. So I recognized it, right? That's why you go through life. You pick up the things that you like. And that some things that you don't like, maybe, you know, you, you don't concentrate in those areas. Right. That failure led you to the right, to the right destination, right. the correct direction. Yeah. That's great. So we're going to move on to the application. So all the accumulation of all of those learning techniques that you've used, I'm interested in an instance that you were able to educate someone on leadership. How did you apply these study techniques to your current job or an area in the Air Force that you were able to teach someone else uh, in an area of leadership? Yeah, leader, <clears throat> leadership is very important. So to be a good leader, you first have to be a good follower. You have to know... You have to know how to follow in order to lead. And a good leader works harder than anyone uh, else that they are in charge of leading. Uh, a good leader never pawns off responsibility on anyone else. Uh, the buck truly stops with a good leader. So the Air Force was really a natural transition into leadership uh, as my career progressed. So um, it became, you know, along with the rank came jobs that had more and more responsibility and leadership roles. Uh, flight chief, uh, you know, department head, um, various opportunities that would come up, some of which I could have said no to, but I think the important thing is uh, I had a colonel you know, some years ago, uh, Colonel Walt Casey, a great mentor. And he used to tell me, uh, as you go along in your career, uh, watch for opportunities to shine. And when those opportunities prevent or present themselves, take advantage of those opportunities to shine. And I think there was a lot of, <clears throat> there was a lot of truth in that. So, leadership roles will present themselves and when they do it's a great opportunity to teach to mentor uh, but most of all is to lead by example um, the best way to recruit people to do what you need them to do is to set the example of what you need them to do uh, don't tell them show them and when you are in when you're in charge of an organization I truly believe that the folks that know how to do their job the best are the ones that do their job. And, and this really is the essence of what I think of as a, as a learning organization. As a leader, my job is to pull out the best of each that work in the organization, not to tell them what to do. I mean, there are times where, you know, there's a task that we need to accomplish and, and that's what we need to do. But you, you leave it up to the people who, who do their jobs to figure out the best way to, to get that task executed. And uh, it was very effective, uh, it still is, even till today, to, uh, to lead by example 
that the buck stops with you as the leader and to bring out the best in those who uh, you are in charge of or that you're leading. Great. So what are some ways that you continue to educate yourself in your current work environment to be a better leader uh, and also to educate your followers on how to, how to implement themselves best into your workplace? Yeah. Well, the first thing <clears throat> is to be aware of what you don't know. Uh, I think it's important as you go along in life uh, to constantly be open to the fact that there's a whole bunch you just don't know. And I think when you do that, you stay humble. When you think you know everything, then you actually become dangerous. And people will lose faith in you. You'll have a credibility problem. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to always remain a student and remain hungry to learn. No matter how old you are, uh, how far along in your career you are, there's always something that you can learn. Um, and I think of what I just recently read about this uh, kind of a T competency, which is interesting. So you, you know, you're out of school and you've got your first job and, and you like it or you don't maybe, but there are sort of things that you, you know, you broaden yourself with and learn additional skills and whatnot in some different areas. But at the end of the day, there's something that you need to dive deep in and be an expert at and really know better than anybody else. I mean, that is really the secret to success is that you've got to be able to, with something, be a resource, be the person who knows everything about a given subject. That doesn't mean to be narrow focused. It's important to have these other interests and to have breadth but you have to have depth of something. And when you do, the leadership opportunities will present themselves. A good leader isn't just someone who knows a great deal about a particular subject. You have to have that as well as a breath, breath of other things that you know as well. So when I read, obviously I read my journals for cancer medicine and, and what have you, but I also and very careful to read, you know, literature and read uh, technical manuals about something and read about, you know, read poetry, uh, read the newspaper so that I'm abreast of the current affairs. And in a social situation, I can have a conversation with someone. Uh, these are all things that make you a, a more well-rounded person. But at the same time, as a leader, it allows you to be able to connect with those uh, who who you lead and who you work with. Very important, uh, just to highlight a couple of things, to stay you know, always hungry for that knowledge, stay on top of your studies. There's never a point where you should stop learning. And I think that's definitely the highlight of, uh, of many people's careers. And like you said, once you figure that out, I, it just doesn't end. And you, you can find success in that constant journey. So thank you very much, Dr. Hale, for joining us on Wingtips Episode 2. We are very happy to have you out today, and uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Good luck.